Welcome back, everyone. My name is Bobby Kilberg, and I'm president and CEO of the Northern Virginia Technology Council. And I'm going to moderate the fireside chat. I never know why they call them fireside. I've not yet ever seen a fireplace <laughs> chat on the tech talent pipeline. As Nisha so clearly explained, economic mobility requires income, and it enables you to have power over your life and its direction. Education and skills acquisition is a fundamental precondition for personal power, and I can think of no more forward-thinking program in Northern Virginia that promotes economic mobility better or more visibly than the Tech Talent Pipeline. This Tech Talent Pipeline is, in its essence, the tool that makes upward mobility possible and real. Launched one year ago, the Tech Talent Pipeline, which is being administered by the Northern Virginia Community College as part of Go Virginia, focuses on helping the K-12 school systems, especially from middle school on up, to increase career awareness and readiness initiatives in Northern Virginia in technology fields. The goal is to increase the number of people who acquire the skills it takes to succeed in these high demand professions creating a workforce system that effectively attracts, prepares, and retains quality, qualified candidates to fill high demand technology jobs. NVTC's Tech Talents Employer Collaborative, begun in 2017, is one piece of the Tech Talent Pipeline, and it creates an employer signaling system for skill, competency, and credential requirements for high demand technology jobs in software development, network infrastructure, cybersecurity, and data analytics. This Tech Talent Employer Co-op Collaborative is now also part of Go Virginia's Tech Talent Pipeline, project number one, under again the auspices of the Northern Virginia Community College. And in collaboration with the Greater Washington Partnership, NVTC is participating in a separate but related project to support sub-baccalaureate IT positions called the New Skills for Youth Initiatives. We also are working with the Northern Virginia Community College in partnership with Amazon Web Services, Telos, John is here, Northrop Grumman, Micron, and hopefully many other companies in an innovative apprenticeship program, Go Virginia's Tech Talent Pipeline Project Number 2, Steve, where NVTC will provide 400 veterans and military spouses as candidates for apprenticeships in cloud, cyber, optics, and fa fabrication, and potentially other training. Veterans and military spouses will constitute part, but not all, of the applicant pool. Of these candidates, the program will select in the range of 100 participants. That's about right, 100. These apprenticeships will be customized for the companies by industry sector, and the students will be hired prior to training, earning salaries of $60,000 a year and up during a training period of about 15 months, plus through AWS, a formal associate's degree in cloud computing has launched. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line here is that these programs are creating economic mobility, which indeed is the topic of our panel. So now let me take the chance to introduce our panelists. In no particular order, Ken Eisner, Senior Manager, Worldwide Education, Amazon Web Services. Say hello. Ray, is I pronounce it correctly, Ray Caho? Right, okay. Um, Senior Vice President and Chief Human Capital Officer, Altamira Technologies Corporation. Steve Partridge, Vice President of Workforce and Economic Development, Northern Virginia Community College. John Wood, CEO and Chairman Telos. Telos and Lauren Racinos, a student in Northern Virginia Community College's cloud computing program. Steve, Steve Partridge, Northern Virginia Community College. Steve. Tell us about the Tech Talent Pipeline and what its goals are. Uh, thank you, Bobby. I think the goals of the Tech Talent Pipeline are pretty broad. Um, one of the early concerns about a year and a half ago when we pitched this idea was that if you went to any place in Northern Virginia and asked anyone in the room kind of what the top jobs were and how do you get them, you get sort of a blank stare back. IT is the number one job requirement in Northern Virginia. And in fact, we probably have a deficit of about 40,000 open jobs that we can't fill locally every year. Meaning we have jobs that I always say are at risk of flight. If we don't find people to fill these jobs, the companies get creative, they steal from each other, they import labor, and they hire locally. But the problem is, 
for the past 10 years have been lucky during the recession. These jobs in Northern Virginia were hot commodities. People moved from all over the U.S. to D.C. They're leaving now. And the, a good economy spread to the rest of the U.S. And places like Charlotte and Nashville and other places have good jobs. And guess what? It's a little cheaper there. So they are now attracting talent to those communities. And companies are starting to get wise and say, why would I put these jobs in Northern Virginia when I can do it cheaper and find talent more readily in other markets? So if people aren't moving to D.C., we've got to get more of our local folks that are in our K-12 system who are growing up here to choose IT career pathways. And so part of that is how do we make that information available to parents, students, teachers? Because if you go to someone in the K-12 system, more times than not, and ask them, I want to get into IT, what should I do? You kind of get that look back. It's like, you should go to college. And they'll help you figure it out because it's a fast-moving career path. And so we need to get that information in the hands earlier and get kids prepared because what we're not doing a very good job is we're not getting as many women and minorities into these high-demand fields. I've sat with John before. There's only 11% of the workforce that are women in, in cybersecurity. If I can show up with students that are female and propose them to be hired by TELUS, he'll, he'll pay me a finder's fee or I'll make them pay me a finder's fee <laughs> because they're high demand targets. So we need to do more of that and we need to think systemically. We just kind of assume that the job market will equalize and it will, but it might not be in our favor. And if we want the jobs to continue in Northern Virginia, we have to be more proactive. So we're looking all the way through K-12. How do we generate interest? How do we make sure that eighth grader that shows STEM interest is aware of the jobs that are here and the camps that can help get that interest higher? And how do they map to dual enrollment programs? So they can graduate high school maybe with a semester or two of college credit under their belt. And how do they then map with financial aid and other tools to get them into the workforce faster? Mm -hmm. And so that's what the whole pipeline's about. And it's gonna take several years to implement all the aspects of it. The long term is a marketing campaign. As Bobby mentioned, apprenticeships part of that because employers care about the long term pipeline, but they need people now. And so how do we get people into the job market faster using apprenticeship and other tools can make them work ready in months, not years. Do you want to be any more specific about the primary strategies that you're using to meet those goals? Yeah. Um, apprenticeship, we have a goal to do four to 500 apprentices a year. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but a year ago, we did zero. Uh, Amazon Web Services is our launch partner. We've done over 150 apprentices in cloud computing. We're getting ready to launch uh, six new employers in the next 60 days, of Telos being one of them, Micron, uh, Northrop Grumman, on apprenticeship and cybersecurity. So we're really excited about scaling that aspect. Uh, in fall, you're going to see a lot more about the tech talent pipeline launching the K-12. We've partnered with every district, all nine of them across the region, to make sure that all schools are embedded with the tech talent pipeline. There's going to be website support. There's going to be internships in phase three where we're going to be going to the employer community saying, listen, we need kids to see what a day in the life is like and how do we open up those opportunities for kids that show promise and interest in IT fields. So over the next three, over the next decade, our goal is to triple the number of IT ready professionals coming out of our K-12 and university system. So that's an ambitious goal because naturally it probably doubles every 10 to 15 years. We're talking about tripling that in the same amount of time. Since this is a, a panel about economic mobility, do you believe these programs contribute to the economic mobility of the students who participate in them? And if so, how? And can you give some specific examples? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest problems is a lot of times the people that succeed in these fields may have, I would say, inside connection. They've got a parent or a parent knows someone that gives them access to internships. Most internships in this community go to people who have connections, not the people that probably need them most. And often, it's not allocated in an efficient way. Um, often, even if we can get a cybersecurity internship, there might be someone who says, well, I really don't want cybersecurity, but I need an internship on my resume for college, so I'll just take it. So we, we are looking at ways to make that more merit, meritocratic in the way that we're distributed. We're trying to get that information in the hands of all parents, because most folks can't tell you how, what it takes to get into IT. And there's a perception issue. It's always some guy in a cube working all night, coding with <laughs> potato chips all over his shirt. <laughs> and for, for young female students, that's like, I don't know if I want to work with this guy. <laughs> and they don't realize that tech today is a little different. Yes, there's coding jobs, but that's a small minority of the jobs in the tech field. There are jobs that work with people in small groups, doing presentations. Our first cohort of Amazon apprentices, actually the first skill that they had to build into the program besides the technical skills was presentation skills. 
because they work with clients so often they had to really brush up. So they spent several weeks in our classrooms working on presentation skills. So it's, it is the soft skills and employers are greedy. They want both. And, and that's okay, but we need to make sure how do we build that into the educational process. And the one thing missing from a lot of education right now is the real world experience. What happens now is most high school students graduate now never having worked. In previous generations, about 70% worked. So they're deferring work until that real first job. And that's, that's the time you really want to shine. And instead, you're walking in going, oh, I didn't know you could wear, you couldn't wear flip-flops to work or you couldn't, you know, I, you want me out here on time? What? You know, we, we all learned that back in high school or that you know, first job, we got yelled at about that. So we need to push that earlier and bring that back. And I think employers are taking note. There are more internships happening now. More students are working than ever before, sometimes because they have to. Um, but we're also seeing more employers open to ideas of internships where it's not just for that senior graduating college, it's for high school. And we need to do more of that in our area. Uh, Ken, uh, AWS, um, and we realize that Amazon is larger than just AWS, but uh, you have committed overall as with the parent to produce 25,000 new jobs over a period of a number of years. And you're sitting here with a number of employers who are going to say, oh my gosh, all, everybody in my company is going to leave to go work at AWS. <laughs> so uh, to prevent that, could you please describe <laughs> or to share the wealth or to grow the jobs because we have 40,000 evidently openings where we can't find people with skills to fill them. Can you describe AWS's curricular collaboration with Northern Virginia Community College? Why did you choose to create this opportunity and what is the potential impact on both the participants as well as on the AWS. Totally. And just to touch on your, your initial uh, point, th the work that we do is meant to be broader than AWS than yes. Amazon. We, you know, we're partnering with John and we're partnering with Cap One and you know, other organizations in the region, Lucy and so on, to feed their talent pipeline. Yeah. There's millions of active customers on AWS, many of them deep within the Northern Virginia region. So this is yeah, something that we, that we believe is good for the whole workforce. Um, first, let me touch on the kind of the macro picture. Um, there's been a bunch of scholarly articles written about this fourth industrial revolution, um, this advent of the cloud and advanced services like I, um, AI, machine learning, robotics, and so on. Um, and it is creating a big shock to the, to the market. Um, AWS itself was the fastest IT vendor to ever hit a $10 billion yearly run rate. It's now a $30 billion yearly run rate just a couple years, a few years later. And it's growing like a startup at a 45% year over year growth rate. This is leading to a massive job opportunity. Cloud computing, cloud and distributed computing was the number one LinkedIn term for the past four years in a row. AI moved its way into the, is now number two. So employers are showing a great demand for these opportunities. People with AWS certifications, it pays at the very top of the market. And these are not just for Amazon AWS jobs, but yeah, I was doing a quick search of Northrop Grumman jobs, and they're looking for people with AWS certification um, as well. So we started AWS Educate, this program that collaborates with, uh, with Nova and others. Um, to address that demand in 2015. We have over 2,400 institutions globally, actually vast demand from India, um, and all the top 10 leading global computer science institutions. But what we saw come out of it was this significant demand from community, vocational, and trade schools. We, we dug deep into that. Um, we see this as a new pipeline. To Bobby's point, if Amazon and Facebook and Google and Microsoft are all competing for the same talent, we're going to continue down that path. Glassdoor has a study where between 2009 and 2015, the time to hire increased by 80%. That dramatic increase is a dynamic loss in innovation to companies such as ours. It also you know, is going to add time and cost. And, and these students who are seeing here with this vast potential are left out of that opportunity. The second thing is that community colleges act as this vast flywheel opportunity for, for just general communities. They connect with K-12, and Steve got into some of that. 
the advanced partnership with George Mason, that connection into <coughs> higher ed, and direct to the wor workforce. Lifelong learning, um, as you know, Nisha mentioned earlier, isn't just about what corporations can provide internal to their employees. If we don't have flexible, modular, specialization certificates where people can go back to school, and no, they're not going to, if we want to widen the, the workforce um, to add inclusive opportunities, they can't just be going to Stanford, right? They've got to be going to these community colleges present this vast opportunity. So we did something in LA and all, of, uh, we started this thing called the LA, we were in part of the LA High Tech um, Coalition in Los Angeles. It, we did a partnership with Santa Monica College. It went really well where we partnered on this curricular collaboration, and that went to 19 colleges, done very well. They've gotten you know, the uh, entry-level certification through AWS, and we took that into Northern Virginia to kind of take that to the next level. We saw visionary leadership, operational excellence, <coughs> a tech capacity, having launched the cybersecurity, having done this apprenticeship. I think they graduate, what's your stat around IT? I, well, with the number of graduates, we're the largest graduation institution in the country besides University of Phoenix for IT degrees. Just amazing. Like, so that potential was absolutely there. We saw the diversity of the region, um, the focus in on veterans, but also immigrant families. I believe 50% you know, of all you know, zero to 18 year olds um, are, of children are immigrants within the Northern Virginia um, area. I think that this is a community, a um, part of the community stats. The the size and the impact of Nova, there, that flywheel that we talked about with K-12 and higher ed and institutions, and they were willing to move fast. I met up with with Scott Rawls, the president, in like February of 2018. By May, they voted on this cloud degree, mm -hmm. and they launched it that fall. It was awesome. Totally typical for universities to move in. Oh my God, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, this, this was the thing. We're seeing like community colleges with visionary leaders and, and operational you know, excellence. Steve, Chad and I, you, you guys were willing to move faster. <clears throat> Do you want to say anything about the advanced program uh, from NOVA to George Mason and how that also helps expand opportunities? Yeah, so we don't, the, this two-year degree opportunity, the reason it's exciting is because you guys are tying into the K-12 side and you have people fully devoted and committed to you know, incubating and launching with Arlington and Fairfax and so on. But also they have this unbelievable partnership with George Mason around the advance. So we're, we're talking now about building that four-year extension um, in addition to ride along straight with George Mason. To, to make this a thick opportunity, um, in addition, obviously, to the collaboration with with uh, companies like like Telos, um, it, it just provides you know, a really fertile opportunity. Is there any other associate degree in addition to cloud computing that you would like to encourage uh, Nova to quickly approve? Yeah, so, <laughs> cloud. Uh, Cloud computing serves as the basis uh -huh. of you know, all of technologies moving to the cloud. Software development lies in the cloud. Cybersecurity, you know, cloud support engineering, operational roles lie in the cloud. Data science and AI, ML, you know, and so on. And so there's a great opportunity with cloud computing as the, as the base and the fundamental for so many of these offshoots to happen and provide people with not just a job, but actually full career paths in technology. Let me move on because we're time limited. Let me move on to John. Uh, John, Telos is also partnering with the community college on the apprenticeship program and also an internship program in K-12. Tell us more about these initiatives, the number of apprenticeships you funded, your experience with the program to date. Sure. Uh, first, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, so first I'm going to tell you what didn't work. Uh, I, I, I got separated in 2006, and one day a local supervisor asked me in Loudoun County whether I would send someone to a, 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 a job fair. It was on a Saturday. 
And I was like, I didn't have my kids that weekend, so I said, you know what, I'll go. So I went to the job fair. And I was the only CEO to go. And I met this kid uh, whose name is Kong Zhao. Kong Zhao was the number one student at Thomas Jefferson. He had perfect scores. He had a 4.5 grade point average. He had a 1,600 on his SATs. And his parents were with him, and they spoke no English. And by the time I got back to my uh, office, after we had talked, Kong had sent me a note, uh, a two-page note, describing why he felt he should work for Telos. And so we hired this guy with ha without having any internship program. And it was a complete disaster. You know, we basically had this incredibly bright mind sweeping the floors, metaphorically. And it was a horrible experience for him, and clearly we didn't get much out of it either. So that was a huge problem. So about five years later, six years later, we, we have been struggling for the longest time uh, about hiring good people. There's a lot of posing that goes on in the region, I think. People claim to be experts in cybersecurity. They claim to know about the cloud. <laughs> they, claim, they claim to know how to do software development. And, and the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of posing. So <clears throat> we began to sit down and ask ourselves the question, what else could we do differently? And so we said, you know, I wonder if we could actually put together a real program, you know, where when we took these kids in, I'm going to talk first about internships, and then I'm going to move to apprenticeships, by the way. Okay. Uh, and I'm not going to follow the script. When we took these kids in, we wanted to make sure that we gave them real-world work. We wanted to make sure that they were doing tip-of-the-spear kind of things. So in other words, if we were doing hacking, you know, with permission, <laughs> clearly, uh, if we were doing hacking, you know, we want them to be helping do it too. If we were building a product and bringing it to market, we wanted them to be part of the core team. If we were doing sales, we wanted them to be actually t sitting in front of customers. If we were doing marketing, we wanted them to do writing with us. And we could care less whether you're a man or a woman or you know, if you're black or white or whatever. We just hire based on the fact that we need people desperately in the, in the jobs that we have. As a for instance, there's one network we've been defending since 1996. I've been, the, I've been told many times I'm the longest serving CEO in the cybersecurity industry globally. I can tell by that picture, that's an old picture. <laughs> anyway, um, it's back when you had a jacket. Anyway, so since 1996, we've been, we were defending this one network. I can't tell you about the, about the name of the customer, but it, you know, just think about it as a Pentagon. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's gone, it's gone from like 200 unauthorized access attempts per day, those would be people trying to get in, to almost 15 million per day. So when you think about what we do, say that we, again, 15 almost 15 million? million unauthorized access attempts per day. So when you think about what we do, we use automation to make our customers more secure. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what the different business line is. I can tell you about our different business lines, which I won't bother you with. But in general, we've invested almost about 3,000 man years, that's a lot of time, into building tools to use automation to make our customers more secure. Anyway, so I go back to this story. And we said, you know what, let's build this program. So we started our first year, we hired 15 kids. And it was kind of like begging and borrowing and stealing to convince kids that this is a, could, be a, could, could be a good job, could be a good thing. It's a 10 week program from start to finish. Now, <clears throat> the reason I know that program was hugely successful is because, not because the kids told me, but because the number of kids that came back was almost 90%, number one. Number two, the other thing that happened was we started getting calls from uh, from parents of other parents of other parents because they'd go to dinner with their friends and they start chatting with each other Which is basically taking advantage of something called Metcalf's law Metcalf's law if you're not familiar <laughs> with it says that the power of a network increases exponentially as each new node gets added And so we were trying to do that. So you fast forward to last year uh, We had I think 1,500 applicants for uh, 50 jobs uh, apprentice job, or uh, internships and then we said uh, who should we be hiring? Uh, how, what, I, wonder, well, I wonder how young can it go, right? So we, we didn't go to zero. Uh, you said zero to 18 earlier. I was like, huh, I don't know anybody that's zero years old, but it's possible. That was just out of the reason. Uh, we're not going after the zero year olds. Zero year olds. It's, it's a, a one year, but a yeah. one year old is fine. So yeah, anyway, uh, so we said, you know what? Um, let's, let's, let's bring this experiment into high school. And so the range of kids that we hire are, are 16 to 22. Um, and what we found, honestly, is that there are some children who are very capable 
uh, but they don't want to go to college. And you know, it's interesting, as a, as a dad, I'm a father of four, I'm going to be raising children for the rest of my life, 19, 15, 5, and 3, perfect. Um, as a father of four, my oldest son, who is, uh, who is an unbelievable student in high school, he, he, he said, Dad, I don't want to go to college. And it's interesting, as a father who had to deal with that sort of the shock of, wait a minute, my son's not going to go to college, I, I don't know if that's, you know, if that's, is that good, is that not good, I, I don't know. And what ended up happening is this kid, you know, he works at Telos, clearly it was nepotism, he, he works at Telos, he works, he works at a restaurant, he's a music director in his church, and he saved $35,000 in one year and four months. So think about that. If he works four years and he's able to continue saving like that, unlike his peers who go to college with debt, he's going to have four years of work experience and he'll have saved well over $100,000. That is actually pretty, pretty significant, I think, right? I mean, think about that. How many of you guys, when you were 21 years old, had 100 grand in the bank? I know I didn't. I had like $10 in the bank at that point in time, and I think I owed... Way back then, I owed something like 60 grand, which back then in the, in the 1885 when I went to school, you know, was, was a lot. So now it's really even more expensive, except if you go to places like Nova, and where it's 3,400 3, bucks-ish per year. After two years, you get your associate's degree. Then you get the guaranteed admission route into all kinds of different schools, not the least of which is a great school like George Mason. So we say to ourselves, this year, we're hiring 75 uh, interns locally. We hire much more than that across the United States, but we're hiring 75 locally. We've had 2,400 people apply from across the United States. And it's incredible, right? So I think that's a really good thing, but here's the problem with internships. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? So it's a 10-week program. We get these kids, they get all liquored up in terms of what we do. They want, to, they want to keep doing it, but they can't because they've got to go back to school. So I'm working hard with organizations like Northern Virginia Community College, with organizations like George Mason, to deal with the apprenticeship issue. Because here's the point. As a student at, in college, I majored in finance and computer science. This will tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, in my majors, I, I, I had perfect scores, but overall I had a 2.7. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> so I, when I got out of college, I had these degrees in finance and computer science, and I happened to go to Wall Street. And when I went to Wall Street, literally the people I worked for, I, I had 15 offers on when I was on Wall Street. One of the reasons probably because I started the first all-volunteer student federal credit union in America, something called the Georgetown University, University Alumni Student Federal Credit Union. And... Uh, uh, so I had job, I had work experience, right, because I was working in this credit union. And uh, they told me to take my degree and throw it in the garbage. And I said, why? And the issue is the following, and it exists today. There's a gap between that which our kids are taught and that which the workplace needs. And the way you fill the gap is with apprenticeships. And so our view, my view, is that the way that gap can narrow is that corporations need to step up they need to uh, sit down and talk to and, and come up with a plan whereby we can take these kids that have a beginning, a middle, and an end, a 10-week program, and we, don't, we have no idea what their background is, and then we have to get them to extend throughout the year. Because the truth is we, we have what we call casual employees with these interns throughout the course of the year, but it's not directly tied back to the universities. And I think to the extent that we can tie it back to the universities, it would make it a much more strong program. And I think organizations like yours and mine and others would be very, very happy to be acquiring talent as fast as we can. Thank you. John, um, I assume from your comments that you do not believe that a four-year de college degree is necessary for success in the technology world. No, of course not. It's not we, hire, we hire people that have high school degrees. We hire people with college degrees. We hire people with master's degrees. We hire people, I have a person who has two PhDs. It really depends on the kind of work they're doing. 
we are a company that invests in automation, but we are also a company that we're the database of record for the entire IC. You know, we wrote an article about, my chief security officer and I wrote an article in 2011 that said the cloud was more secure, which is to say that my chief security officer wrote an article and I got to put my name on it. Uh, but it went over like a lead balloon at the time. But then a funny thing happened. You know, in 2013, middle of the year, the arguably the most security conscious organization in the world, the CIA, said, hey, we're going to go to the cloud. And that was a shot heard around the world as it relates to cloud computing. Because at the time, you guys were, you know, you were pretty big, but you weren't that big. I mean, and, and from, that, from that point forward, I mean, that was, that was kind of crazy. So then the CIO for the CIA asked me, hey, hey, John, could you do the same thing for the cloud that you've been doing on-premises for the better part of 18 years? And I said, yeah. And then our, that's how we got together and became very, very close partners, because we were the, the security for the Amazon cloud and commercial cloud services. And, and, and a whole range of other things as well. And it's been a hugely successful partnership. So we think of security as helping to drive cloud adoption. Because if we can evidence that you're actually more secure, which you are in the cloud, then you're better off than you are on premises. And I'm gonna give a quote to a guy named Sean Roach, who you don't know, but he's a guy that runs a big, big part of the CIA. He said publicly the following, the worst day of the cloud is better than the best day on premises from a security point of view. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, you're up now. Uh, Lauren is a student at uh, Northern Virginia Community College's cloud computing program, the, the AWS program with, with Nova. Why? Why did you join the program? How did everything everybody has said so far apply to you? Um, so I did not finish college when everyone else did, and uh, so I've raised four children, and three of them are semi-successful. Um, <laughs> and one of them is not. <laughs> and one of them is not. So I think it was, <laughs> it was my turn to, uh, to, go back to, to go back to school. So uh, prior to that, I've been, uh, I've been managing middle management uh, in a fitness, fitness clubs in the area, and I was at a point where I just couldn't go any further. I needed more education, but also the field, there's just not, there wasn't really anywhere for me to go. So I've always kind of looked at IT, and when I've asked people about it, they always say, um, oh, go get a certificate. Okay, what certificate? How do I get it? It's, and you, you, know, you get on the internet and you start looking for this, and it's, there's just no clear way. So I saw this press release that Amazon was partnering with uh, Nova, and they, they created this cloud computing degree. And so I think I emailed my uh, advisor that day and said, this is what I want to do. So um, that's how I got here. And what opportunities will this provide you that you would not have had otherwise with, with this certificate or degree? Well, I won't be having to work as manager on duty on Sunday <laughs> afternoons anymore. <laughs> um, I, so I, hopefully I'll have a job with Amazon uh, when I finish. But what's great about it is, is it's, we're using the Amazon labs for, for class, but it's also broader than that. So I think that, that what we're doing, uh, or, or what I'm learning, is not specifically Amazon, and I'll be able to, um, you know, do something in the IT, IT field. I was sort of hoping, well, I'm looking at Solutions Architect. That's, uh, that's the plan, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, last batter up, because we are running out of time. We won't make five minutes, though, I'm sorry. Uh, Ray. Uh, you're head yeah. of recruitment for Altamira, which is a private industry government contractor. Can you kind of summarize what we discussed so far by explaining to us what the challenges are that you face when you try to find talent? Sure, yeah, doing um, uh, recruiting every day, the, our challenges are, are exactly what my colleagues have said here. Um, just to give you some sobering facts about how it goes on in doing recruiting every day, um, you know, we're about uh, 380 employees and we service the um, uh, national intelligence um, community, um, we are a fraction of what Telos is. And in our challenges, resources is our key issue. Uh, we're a very, uh, a much smaller player. 
So, uh, but we're looking for the same type of talent that is being um, trained and going through these um, type of programs. Um, we are not specifically engaged with programs with them, but we are engaged with programs uh, with other universities. We're partnered with Virginia Tech, uh, University of Maryland. Um, so we do a lot of um, internships ourselves. That is one of our aspects. But just to give you some idea of what we're, we're up against, uh, so we consider ourselves a niche player. We could be easily 1,000 employees very quickly, but we stay focused on the national intelligence community, which um, requires the highest level of security clearance. So all candidates that we are looking for, we're talking about economic mobility, the challenge of getting um, the right talent, it's not that there's not just enough talent, it's that there's not enough good choices from that talent. So John's point is correct. It's, there's a lot of posers out there. We meet a lot of candidates that say they can do a lot of things, but when you meet them, um, they're not exactly qualified. Um, so uh, I, I recently read that, uh, so all of our roles in our, um, in our company require the highest level of security clearances. We have about 90% of our, over 90% of our employees have a security clearance of some level, um, usually at the highest end, which is a top secret full scope polygraph. Um, the challenge of getting that already eliminates part of our opportunity to hire em uh, employees with H-1B visas or foreign nationals. It's just a very tough challenge, and we chose this thing th to make it really difficult um, to do it that way. So I commend the NVTC, Bobby, and her work with um, our um, government officials on, you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. On, on our ability to, um, uh, yeah. press, press it again. You guys hear me? Your red thing is still not on. Yep. You need to this one? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. 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 Yeah, I'm back. All right. Um, so what I was saying was um, where we are in terms of our ability to hire. Uh, why don't you try hers? Hers, the red light's on on hers. You have to lean way over. Change seats. <laughs> Change seats. <laughs> All right, back. You don't look like Lauren, but proceed. It's okay. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? How about now? There we go. <laughs> what, what I was saying was that um, uh, what I recently read was that because we, we, our, our roles require the highest level of security clearances, it, it reduces our opportunity to hire um, a multitude of people. I mean, just... Um, the challenges alone of firing, uh, finding quality talent has been challenging. So um, for security clearances and what we do, which is a government requirement of our ability to, to hire these uh, individuals, um, we look for opportunities with internships to hire these students and then find opportunities to get them into a situation where we can sponsor their security clearance. Um, but it is a long-term um, goal, and with opportunities abroad, things like uh, Amazon eventually coming, and Amazon's already here, as John has pointed out, it is, it's challenging to keep these, uh, these young students and keep them engaged. Um, so I recently read that um, in December, the uh, National Background Investigations Bureau uh, has a backlog of 605,000 cases for security clearances they're trying to work through. It's a challenge for them. They're about to, that is down 16% from April of 2018, where they had 725,000 cases. Um, every one of our employees goes through this process, and um, they are closing right now between three and 4,000 cases a week, but they're also getting 55,000 new cases each week. So the challenge of finding, it's, well. it's <laughs> they're making a small dent in where it's going, but you, got, you have to commend them. That, uh, you know, as, as John and I, our, our industries work, our jobs, our, our employees protect national security. These are not nothing jobs. These are jobs that are very difficult to fill with very challenging um, work that they're doing on customer side or at, at our locations. And the talent is, the pool, it's not a pool, it's a puddle, right? We're fishing from the same puddle. So um, the initiatives that um, Ken and Steve, that they're putting forth, we, we have to have programs like this. If we don't, we're not going to have enough people to fill any, close to any number of these types of jobs. I would just like to add to that that uh, Kevin Phillips, who's the CEO of Mantech, uh, has led a coalition that we've been part of, of the private sector, to push very hard to accelerate and rationalize and make sense of the security clearance process. And Senator Warner deserves a huge amount of thanks from everybody in this room. It is actually moving. It's on the highest priority list of the government now, and I fully believe that the year 2019 will see major, major progress. If it doesn't, we're all in deep 
deep, yes, deep. Yes, we're in deep. <laughs> but, but I really believe it will be, and I think you, your, your issues will be somewhat ameliorated. We are at the stop time. I want to just take one half second to ask you to describe, I know you're very focused on young women and the workforce. Did you describe for a second the sponsorship of STEM events for girls? Yeah. And then we're going to have to close. Absolutely. Just very quickly, um, we partner with uh, Washington Exec, and we are a sponsor at the Nightsmith School for a STEM program. It's, that's, this is all youth, but it's also focused on um, young female students. But really also, um, the last couple of years, we've partnered with uh, Technica, which is the uh, world's largest uh, women's all-women's hackathon. Um, at the University of Maryland the last couple of years, they've held a 24-hour hackathon, only women allowed. There were about 800-plus 800, 800 um, female students that participated. Uh, we were judges for best hardware hack. Um, we actually awarded, I don't know how this young lady got in there. She, she was only 12 years old, must have snuck in. Uh, but she, in 24 hours, with a uh, sponsor, she didn't sleep, she got a, a mentor to help her. Uh, she learned JavaScript in 24 hours and created a small website that could, could help you adopt a cat or a dog. It was a very rudimentary, we awarded her a prize, obviously, it was unbelievable. We were like, okay, here's also our business card, please, <laughs> you know, um, because that, that's an amazing town, right? When you're 16. old enough to yeah. legally work. <laughs> when you turn 16, don't go to tell us, come to, come to me. <laughs> um, but as I said, we also partner with uh, universities uh, outside of this uh, process. But, you know, I am a product myself of Nova and George Mason, so it does work. We, I know that. I want to thank the panel for their presentations and comments. It's been extraordinarily valuable. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Julie Coons. I'm the president and CEO of the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce, and I will be moderating the panel, Moving Ideas into Practice. Let me start with just a, a couple observations. On February 7th, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell called income inequality the biggest challenge in the next 10 years, pointing out that the U.S. used to be a global leader in economic mobility or the ability of people born into poverty to move into middle class or even the upper echelons of society. Powell stated that this was just no longer true. He said, quote, the US lags now in mobility, and that's not our self-image as a country, nor is it where we want to be, end quote. A full 68% of the US economy is consumer spending. Better jobs and higher wages make consumer spending possible. From an economic point of view, doesn't it benefit everyone here in this room, in this community, to help turn as many Northern Virginians as possible into spending consumers? Isn't that the core of the business case for economic mobility? We just heard for about the tech talent pipeline and the opportunities for both the students and tech companies that it creates, but there are other emerging strategies and local practices that also promote economic ability, mobility. And here to discuss that is my distinguished panel of guests, representing local governments and the private sector. So I will introduce them, um, and you have their bios in your program. So uh, to my immediate left is Jeff Grass, chairman of Hungry Catering. To his left, Carla Bruce, chief equity officer for Fairfax County Government. Matt Erskine, executive advisor, Booz Allen Hamilton. And to his left, David Remick, Executive Director, Alexandria Arlington Regional Workforce Council. Um, I believe that we are going to uh, try and allocate a little bit of time at the end for questions, so uh, keep your uh, focus on that as, as we move through our panel. So I'm gonna move over here, make it a little easier. Thank you. So Carla, I'm gonna start out with you. Sure. So, what are the economic mobility challenges that Fairfax County is facing? And tell us a little bit about One Fairfax. Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Um, so the economic, let me start by saying Fairfax County is a great place to live, learn, work, and play. And then when, when you look at a county of 1.2 million people and the percentages would reflect that most people in Fairfax County are doing well. However, Race and place matter, and I think when you talk about 
people, particularly African Americans and Latinos, and, and also where people live geographically within the county, we'd see some stark differences. And in particular, again, around the topic of economic mobility, I think it's worth noting a couple points. And I'm going to refer to my notes because I don't want to get the numbers wrong. So one is we're currently in the midst of a, a dramatic um, uh, demographic shift. And in fact, by next year, so that's 2020, Fairfax County will be a majority minority community. Um, and those patterns will continue um, over the coming years. When we look at wages, there are dramatic differences in terms of race in that, again, African and Americans and Latinos tend to make lower wages in Fairfax County um, than the general population. And there's an increase in the number of low-income people that, um, that uh, live in Fairfax County and can, in general, across the board, an increase of low-income people. The county, like I said, it's a great place to live, learn, work, and play. We have relatively low levels of poverty, but um, when you look at our poverty rates, blacks and Latinos tend to have higher poverty rates. And in fact, there are a total of 15, around 15% 15 of our population, and again, a, a population of 1.2 million people, who live at or below the 200% uh, of poverty. So that's making it about $50,000 for a family of four. So that's um, pretty unimaginable, thinking about living in a community such as this. And overall, when you think about our gross domestic product, the GDP, Fairfax County, if people were able to live to their fullest potential and be, um, and there were no racial disparities in income, Fairfax County's gross domestic product would be 26.2 billion higher. So, given all those statistics, I think our uh, Board of Supervisors and School Board, and we have representatives of those, both bodies here, took a very bold action in acknowledging that racial and social equities exist, inequities exist in Fairfax, and um, adopted first the One Fairfax Resolution, which was adopted um, in July of 2016, which basically says that racial and social equities, inequities exist and that the county government and school system will work together uh, and collectively with the community to address them. Um, and then they furthered that commitment through the adoption of the One Fairfax policy. And that really directs the consideration of equity in all of our planning and decision making across the government um, system as well as across the, uh, the school system. I'm the chief equity officer for Fairfax County government. Fairfax County Public Schools also has a chief equity officer and we work very closely together on identifying those um, strategies and policies that will advance equity again in our respective systems, but also looking at opportunities for shared work. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Let me jump to, to Dave. Dave, um, tell us a little bit about what Arlington County is doing uh, to promote economic uh, mobility and what do you see as some of the barriers to employment? Sure. Uh, so let me just set the table quickly. Uh, Arlington County, is an ex uh, its economy is extremely healthy. And we have the lowest unemployment in the Commonwealth of Virginia, as well as the Greater Washington Region. We're about 1.7 percent right now. Uh, the people uh, who are not uh, working face significant barriers to employment, and these barriers range from lack, lack of skills to not being able to access or afford child care or transportation to health care issues uh, and, and much, much more. Arlington is a young community uh, where the average age is 34 years old. Uh, over 55% of our residents are in their prime working uh, ages, and they are working. Uh, also, uh, who else is working? 31,000 individuals over the age of 55 are working. Everybody that's available to work is working, it seems, in Arlington County. Over 76% of our residents hold a bachelor's degree or higher, uh, but 8,200 residents do not have a high school diploma or a GED. And 288 residents uh, that are ages 16 to 19 are either not in school did not graduate high school or are uh, unemployed. 23% of, of our residents are foreign born and 16,000 residents uh, are limited English proficient. When we look at our median household income, we have about $112,000 uh, uh, median household income, while at the same time, 4% of our households receive food stamps. And this is the one that kills me the most. One in five Arlington children under the age of five are living in poverty. One of the reasons, uh, excuse me, Child care costs uh, cost more in Arlington than anywhere else in the greater Washington region. Uh, if you are a parent uh, or a family that is an infant or a four-year-old, it costs $42,705 to put them into child care. That's, 
38% of the median household income. So yeah, economic mobility is a huge concern for uh, many of our residents. And you can't look at this from just a workforce development issue. You need to look at it holistically, which is why Arlington is doing something to support the economic mobility of our most of our uh, many of our most vulnerable residents. Arlington County's Continuum Care, uh, this is our nonprofit uh, community-based organizations along with the Department of Human Services, support our residents with varying needs, including crisis assistance, housing supports, <coughs> food assistance, and we've partnered together on a program we call 200 Bridges Initiative. This initiative was born out of the Bridges Out of Poverty movement. Bridges brings people from all sectors and economic classes together in a coordinated way to improve job retention rates, build resources, improve outcomes, uh, and guide and support those who are moving out of poverty. For many who struggle uh, for economic mobility, it's a generational struggle. In a family, there are various programs uh, uh, for families. It's a gen in, in a family, excuse me, uh, there could be various programs to target the individual, very, various federal, state, and uh, local uh, programs. But there aren't many that target the family, and there are very, very few that target the family holistically. And this is what we're trying to do with our 200 Bridges uh, initiative. What we're doing is we're using a team-based case management approach, so we're meeting with the family together, uh, so that, they, uh, that the family together uh, receives assistance together, uh, so that we can prove their status to give them affordable and stable housing, health and mental health, food security, educational opportunities, including quality early childhood, uh, child care, workforce development activities, financial assets, and various other forms of social capital. You know, this case management team that I was talking about includes staff from housing assistance, public benefits assistance, our American Job Centers, which is job training and employment, and our community organizations. So together, we're all working uh, with the family to holistically support their economic mobility. Last November, we launched a pilot of this program, uh, and we are working right now with 15 families, and our case management teams have met with them several times over the past few months. Uh, we have begun to uh, assess their needs and develop their service strategy, and so far this is looking to be a very promising process. I mentioned in the beginning that one of our barriers to working is affordable childcare. Many of our Bridges families have difficulty accessing childcare to, just to go to one job interview. I actually just came from Arlington today because right now at this time at uh, Arlington Mill Community Center, which is in the neighborhood where many of our uh, Bridges families uh, live, we're holding a job fair that includes employers and occupations that are specifically targeted to those families' career interests. And guess what? We have free child care on site. And I just left there and there are several toddlers in there while their parents are looking for a job. Uh, more importantly, these jobs either come with benefits or are tied to uh, a pathway towards getting benefits, which is really a huge piece of a puzzle of economic mobility. So in Arlington, all we're doing is trying to knock down these barriers so that people can achieve their dreams. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. You know, uh, I'd like to turn Jeff to you, uh, leader in the private sector, hungry marketplace. Tell us a little bit about the business and then obviously uh, today's topic, how you see that relating to economic mobility. Sure, Julie, thank you. Um, hi everybody, I'm Jeff Grass um, from Hungry. Um, we are, um, uh, Hungry is really the, the first ever platform that connects companies with top chefs throughout a region um, to provide office food, office catering. Um, we're at the core a technology company. We're based in Arlington, Virginia. We're a venture-backed business um, and have created uh, a digital marketplace that um, really taps into this source of supply, great local chefs cooking out of wholesale locations, typically incubator kitchens and other community kitchens throughout a region, uh, to provide much, much higher quality food at, uh, at, at, and, 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 and producing food at a much lower cost structure than if you're sourcing food from a restaurant or traditional catering company. So we uh, are, are kind of like an Uber for chefs, if you will. So chefs work on our platform as 1099s. Um, we have over 70 chefs that, that uh, participate on our platform in Washington, D.C., and then we also have a marketplace in, in, in uh, Philadelphia, and we're getting ready to launch in Atlanta next month. Um, and, uh, and what we are really excited about you know, from, from this topic is, is that it really is providing an alternative career path for great local chefs. Um, we have chefs now making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a month on our platform. Um, and they're really, really high quality chefs. We have former White House chefs, we have 
James Beard chefs, we have chopped champions. Um, the former number two chef at the MGM National Harbor quit his day job to do Hungry full time. And so it really creates kind of an interesting opportunity for them um, and, uh, and lots of uh, entry level opportunities for our, our catering captains as well. Terrific, terrific. You know, Matt, you've worked at both, uh, or I should say, at the local, state, and federal level uh, on these issues. Can you tell us a bit about your work in economic mobility uh, and, and examples of success that you've seen work other places that we may want to consider? Yeah, great. Thank you, Julie, very much. And actually, thank, thank all of you for being here for this, I think we can all agree, an incredibly important uh, topic uh, for this region. Um, so, Julie, as you mentioned, um, I'll refer, I think, uh, mostly to my work at the U.S. Economic Development Administration, where we invested about $300, $350 million a year in communities across the country in job-creating economic mobility projects, uh, which tended to be public-private higher education partnerships. Um, we, our, our charge, our statutory charge was to invest in distressed communities. And, we often don't think of our region as a distressed community, but we do know that there are pockets uh, within uh, our region that are economically challenged. I think that my perspective is informed because we I use investment deliberately. It was competitive funding. It wasn't formulaic funding. So communities had to come to us with competitive ideas for how they were going to utilize uh, the federal funds, and we required a one-to-one -one match. So the community had to have skin in the game, and I think that's important. But in terms of, of I, think, uh, I think, as Nisha said earlier, there's no silver bullet. No one has the answer. Uh, but there are some common elements uh, that I saw uh, from my work across uh, the country. Um, first and foremost, uh, any effort either has to be employer-led or have uh, significant, significant employer engagement. Um, secondly, it needs to be a multi-jurisdictional effort. Um, I think we find in this region, we have many counties, cities, and towns. Uh, we have disconnected, well-meaning organizations. Um, and I think it's important to note that there are very, very, very good efforts um, and recognize that there are tremendous, tremendously good efforts going on. Uh, but I think we, we can all agree that we need to do a better job with the connection of those efforts because we know that resources are limited, certainly from a private sector standpoint from a state and federal uh, resources standpoint. We don't want to be fighting over limited pots of money if we can do a better job. And the examples that I saw across the country were where they actually created those connections so that they weren't fighting over those limited resources. Um, thirdly, I would say, uh, in addition to being employer-led, there was a clear, credible regional organization that, that took the lead and was clearly recognized as taking the lead that had the credibility and had the connection with the employer, the business community. Um, it required a coalition and it's wonderful to hear from that last panel and from some other examples that we've certainly seen across this region where uh, the higher education institutions are at the table. George Mason, Northern Virginia Community College. Um, we know that both Virginia Tech and UVA are investing heavily in this region. We need to look for ways to increasingly pull them in uh, uh, in a meaningful way at the table. Um, and then I think importantly, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about this later, is that they had a, a, a specific roadmap. Um, and I think we've seen some examples of those roadmaps, whether it comes to the tech pipeline uh, or in some other cases not just a strategy, but a true implementation plan um, that both had the broader strategy, but then the short-term momentum building wins. And I'll just give uh, one example. Um, I think a, a, a region similar to ours, Greater Houston. So the lead organization there is the Greater Houston Partnership, which actually brings together economic development, workforce development, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, so the employer community, and they've created what's called Upskill Houston, um, which is an employer-led uh, initiative that is doing some interesting things. To David's point, not just focusing on workforce, but the support services. So they partner with United Way to address the housing, transportation, and child care needs as they target the disadvantaged populations. They work with the employers in new ways to survey them, and we know we get over-surveyed, but they've come up with a new way to actually survey their employers in a way that really gives them granular data in terms of then bringing that back to the 
community education organizations k through sixteen to really address the needs and then thirdly they really focus on industries that are big in their region so we heard from the last panel about i t of course being dominant but i think this region also needs to focus on our health care and hospitality when we think about the broader array of industry opportunities that we have here in northern virginia carla can i come back to you and follow on uh to matt's comments you know what are some specific strategies you're employing in one fairfax and how does that fit with some of you know matt's experience that he observes about success in other regions yeah so i appreciate um the remark from the other panelists because i think it just reinforces you know the need for a broad strategy as well as sort of um the short-term wins that really help you to begin to move your whole system in a community in, in the right direction. So when we think about sort of all the data and the statistics that I named early on, what we know there are a few things that are driving those inequities. Um, uh, education drives those inequities, housing drives those inequities, transportation drives those inequities. Um, and so what we're doing now is sort of looking at investing in strategies that will help to impact that. So looking at the expansion of early childhood education is, is one um, particular example. We're in the midst of a strategic plan around housing affordability, affordability and realizing that that is sort of a related challenge to a lot of the things that we're talking about. And I think that's the unique role of local government is sort of looking at the conditions in which people live and trying to create the conditions that enable people to live to their fullest potential. And so those are a couple of areas that I heard spoken about earlier where I think we're looking to take particular policy action, again, to create the conditions that would enable people to thrive here. Mm -hmm. You know, Dave, let me jump to you. Are you finding receptivity, and Carla, if you comment on this, and then I want to turn to Jeff, but are you finding receptivity from the business community, um, uh, back to Matt's point about um, certainly employer-led and high employee, employer engagement is so important. You know, how are you interacting with that business community? Are they being receptive? Um, what can they do uh, to, to really move, help you and all of us move the needle? I think first of all, it's important to know there's like 30,000 companies in Arlington and Alexandria. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be able to talk to all of them. Uh, but the ones that I have talked to are very receptive. You know, there are 140,000 jobs that are open right now in the greater Washington region. And there's maybe 90,000 people that are unemployed. Really, everybody that's working is working. And everybody that's not working, we need to get off the bench and put them into a job. Employers are facing the hardest time ever in history trying to find talent. And so they are open to. Uh, new ideas, new opportunities on how we could be engaging uh, each other. Um, you know, some of my uh, uh, great successes is dealing with small businesses because they don't have the recruiters and HR departments that most larger firms have. And so they're looking for people, even with no skills, but are eager to learn and will show up on time and do the things that they need to do uh, uh, to uh, succeed. And they will train them to do those things. So. I, I think it's, it's a huge challenge. It's incredibly, incredibly complex. We try to oversimplify it, but there are over 6,000 different occupations in the greater Washington mm -hmm. region. Uh, there's just, it, it's just a very complex situation. There is no silver bullet, as Matt mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Carla, do you have a specific sort of way that, that either you're engaging or opening, you know, sort of that opportunity for businesses to engage with you around this One Fairfax initiative and, for that matter, other activities that... Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we're involved right now in a strategic plan around housing affordability. And when you look around that table in terms of who's participating, um, I'm impressed by the sort of balance of perspectives that are there. So we have everyone from, you know, people who are service providers or, you know, trying to address and advocate for the needs of people who are low income and in need of um, um, uh, a range of housing options. But we also have the development community who are coming in and bringing a, one, a realistic perspective, but also, uh, you know, sort of recognizing their role in addressing this as a challenge. So that's one particular example. But the one thing that I think is important to sort of put on, on the table is, is I think in order to change how you act, you have to first change how you think, right? And so I think part of what we're trying to do at this phase of one Fairfax, so to speak, is it's... It, you, you can begin to name some of those short wins, in, um, but 
what we're also in the midst of is what Nisha had referred to earlier, is a real narrative change in helping people to understand what's going to contribute to a successful Fairfax County, and a successful Fairfax County is an equitable Fairfax County. So trying to engage all sectors, including the business community, to sort of buy in to the set of actions and policies that, are enable, that are, will enable a, an equitable Fairfax County. And again, it might not be the same set of policies that folks are typical you know, typically engaged in. It might be around education or early childhood education. It might be around housing affordability. It might be around food insecurity. But all of those things are necessary if you're talking about creating um, an equitable community. So part of the way that we're trying to engage with the business community as well as other sectors is to help people to understand the range of activity that's necessary and the collective <coughs> responsibility and role. Uh, that we all sort of share in terms of what we like to talk about as unlock unlocking the potential of every Fairfax County resident. And so I think that narrative shape change and that mind shift is another way that we're working with, again, not just the business community, but other sectors. Go ahead, Matt, please. Um, I just wanted to make sure um, the, the previous panel, uh, and I'd like to give a plug for apprenticeships. I think mm -hmm. that's the other, um, critical element that at least uh, we saw across the country with successful communities who are addressing this issue. The, the earn and learn, um, I think it was well articulated. Um, you have to have uh, the, the employer leading the way, but you need, to David's point, to make sure uh, that you have the necessary support behind that. Um, the data is clear in terms of the return on investment to employers on apprenticeships, and we need to tell that story more. Too often, apprenticeships are perceived as being in the constructions and the trades, which is which is great and which is needed and certainly needed in this region when we look at um, the construction, commercial, residential, industrial. Um, but incredible opportunities we heard uh, about IT, but there are incredible apprenticeship models now being implemented in healthcare and hospitality. Um, again, growing sectors uh, for our region, and again, it. It provides both the employer the return because you, you actually have someone who is working and it's providing the skills development uh, for the employee uh, to further uh, their skills and a career pathway that isn't dependent on a four-year degree. Um, but actually, the, again, great data and we need to tell the story as much as we can about the successful career pathways that apprenticeships provide. So that's another critical element that we saw across the country. You know, Jeff, I imagine that you get, um, with your history as a highly successful entrepreneur um, uh, building this, this amazing new company, you must get a lot of executives who come to you and say, you know, what is it? If I want to emulate what you've done in, in value and in mission, you know, what do I do? What, what can I incorporate in how I think and how I act in my company? What, what kind of advice do you give them? Yeah, I was thinking, um, just kind of playing off of what Carla said, you know, how you think drives kind of your actions. So at, at Hungry, we, we try to have, um, it's a very purpose-driven company um, with the purpose of, you know, how do we make the lives of everyone we touch better? And so we try to be very thoughtful and very holistic in our approach. So thinking very much about the chefs that, 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 that operate on our platform, how do we make their lives better? And so it's greater levels of income, it's, it's more um, uh, schedule flexibility, it's being able to cook their own recipes, it's, you know, it's you know, lots of things that really attract, helping them build a, a personal brand as well, you know, are things that attract them. Um, we think a lot about our primary buyers who are office managers and executive assistants and, you know, what are their pain points and, and where are their frustrations? And, um, um, and so how do we make their lives better and those that are consuming the food and then those that are on our team and even the communities in which we operate. Um, and and what I, I think when you, you try to have that more holistic view, you can start to get really creative in, in figuring out ways to make it better for everybody. And, and if you can find that harmony, I think it can really create great things. You know, as an example, you know, we're in the food delivery business, right? We have these chefs working on our platforms, all these different locations. We own the delivery to make it really reliable because reliable delivery and a high level of service is something that our buyers, you know, value greatly. And what's interesting is the entire industry of food delivery is all about trying to deliver at the lowest cost possible. And what you get is what you pay for is, is you know, unreliable delivery, you get low levels of service, you get very poorly trained people. And so instead, we've tried to optimize around how to make it amazing and first, and then cost efficient second. 
And so I think we pay at a much higher level than, than most for our catering captain teams. Um, you know, it's a, it's a starting wage of $15 an hour, but with tips they're making $23 on average. Um, and, and really put a lot of training and, um, and, and education into the role to try to elevate them to provide a great experience for our clients. And so, you know, it, it's I think a, a good sort of entry level career opportunity for lots of folks and helping them teach them a lot of, 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 of skills that I think will be useful down the road. Um, but again, it's around how can we do this in a creative way to make it better for everybody. Yeah. You know, I hear this consistent theme that this is a holistic challenge and it needs a holistic solution. And I, I recall uh, Nietzsche's comments on this awareness gap um, between employers and would-be employees. And I suspect that's true around the ecosystem of this solution. You know, I, I, you know, Matt, you talked about, you know, the community coming together. Clearly, Dave has, has brought together, um, you know, Fairfax County, you're bringing folks together. One more, I mean, how do we create, I mean, we take it from here to a much region, much more regional approach. Is there, are there things you've thought about that are gonna make that difference? Uh, are you leading in that area? One particular thing I wanted to bring up, actually two particular things I wanted to bring up is, um, so I'm not unique in my role as being the Chief Equity Officer of Fairfax County. There is a um, growing sort of national movement around organizations, uh, jurisdictions across the country who are acknowledging that these inequity trends need to be strategically addressed and looked at and designating the resources and the policy action to address them. And locally, I will say that um, I'm involved in conversations through the Council of Governments where we are looking at, you know, um, sort of the regions approach, the broader metropolitan regions understanding and approach around addressing trends of inequity. So that's one thing. But the other sort of um, more tangible way um, is also, you know, I said government plays a really uh, important role in sort of acknowledging the inequities that exist and, and addressing some of those fundamental historical imbalances in society and access to the sort of structures of opportunity. But a tactical way that we are sort of exploring our role is as an anchor institution in, of, of the region. You know, we're a major employer. Fairfax County employs 13,000 people. Um, I think the school system employs over 20,000 people. Um, who are we employing, right? And um, so that's one way that we are sort of looking at ourselves as a driver of economic mobility. Also, our procurement, the amount mm -hmm that we procure and what we procure and how we can make those sorts of investments in ways that boost economic mobility. So there's the theoretical concepts that I think we're trying to, to lay out, but we're also trying to be an active leader in the region at the metro region level, but also um, at the Northern Virginia level around this idea of being an anchor. And so uh, the, actually it's the Community Foundation of Northern Virginia that's leading that effort and is um, bringing that discussion around community wealth building um, um, to the table. And I think that's a really important way that those of us that carry some level of power and influence through our institution um, can also play a role in promoting the notion of economic mobility. Terrific, terrific. I want to make sure we have time for questions, and I may have lost my, my timing on this, but are there questions that are coming from the audience um, that so don't want to miss the opportunity for all of you to weigh in or ask some specifics. You know, while we're waiting, Julie, while we're waiting for, please, for please. a question uh, to address your, you know, I think <coughs> we, we all know that there are um, amazing uh, efforts and initiatives and programs um, going on in this region, Community Foundation, the Chamber, um, in Fairfax County, in Arlington, Alexandria. Um, I, I served in a regional organization here, and I saw this firsthand and having grown up in this region. We, number one, are a bit of a victim of our success because we've been very successful as a region, and we heard, uh, we've heard the statistics both in terms of how well we're doing and then also the statistics about how challenge, challenged we are in, in, in certain parts of our region. But I think the key thing is, is we have so many well-meaning organizations uh, that it tends to be disconnected. And again, going back to private sector businesses um, who are looking to invest both in their self-interest and in their enlightened self-interest through corporate social responsibility and otherwise, have um, 
almost uh, uh, sort of too much to look at. And so I think we really need as a region to think about how do we become less disconnected from an organizational standpoint, um, both in terms of leveraging the funding that's out there, federal, state, local, and, and private, and of course philanthropic. Um, are, we, are we going after that in the best way possible as well-meaning and, and um, well-meaning organizations? So I think sort of that bringing a little bit more connectivity, mm -hmm. um, I know it sounds commonsensical, but again, the regions that have done this well across the country that I've seen um, have been more coherent in terms of their approach um, and have brought more connectivity um, amongst their well-meaning organizations. Great, great. Questions? Great. Hey, hi. Um, my name's Erin McKinney. I'm from Just Neighbors. We do immigration legal services. And one of my questions is really how do we leverage this really untapped potential of the immigrant community, um, many of who are in mixed families of both documented and undocumented. Um, I think it, it plays to the instability of of our tech pipeline for many of these kids coming through who are U.S. citizens with undocumented parents. And so how can we as a community look to support folks getting documented, um, not only just um, advocating with, with on the federal level, but, but even funding their ability to pursue documentation? Who wants to take that So on? I love the question. I'm going to half answer it because <laughs> the documentation part, that's, that's a hard nut to crack. And we're, I mean, it, it's a hard one. It, obviously, from the county's perspective, it, we're always looking at that. But I do want to talk about tapping an incredible uh, talent, uh, talented workforce in our foreign, uh, our, our foreign born workers. And last year, I, we uh, at Alexander Arlington held a uh, foreign workers career event. It wasn't necessarily a career fair. It was an opportunity to explore the different uh, industries and occupations that are in the greater Washington region so that these individuals could get some exposure and see what might interest them. When I was there, I was talking to this individual. In his home country, he was an information security analyst. He had certifications from his home country. His certifications did not translate to America. He was working as a valet at uh, the Hilton Mark Center. I was banging my head against the wall. He's fully employed, so the funds that I have, I can't support him. What can I do? Well, thank God that a great organization came together. Go Virginia, Northern Virginia, uh, has money, and I was able to win a grant where I'm able to now support individuals like that, skilling them up skilling them up in certifications that are in demand here in the Northern Virginia region so that we could take them from a valet, which is a good job, to a better job as an information security analyst here in one of our many companies. So I think we need to look at this workforce. George Mason has a study on the, um, on the foreign workforce. It's on their website. You should check it out. Uh, I don't think people know how big this talent pipeline is. Uh, and I think we should continue to do everything that we can to try to bridge the, the documentation issue. Perfect. Other questions, please? I can't see, but speak right up and we'll find you. Hi, good morning. This, I'm Francie Lim Youngberg. I'm the VP for External Affairs at Melwood. Many of you probably know us as a vehicle donation place, but we're also a workforce solution for employers. We employ about a thousand people of differing abilities, and we're about 65 contract sites in this region. And so my question really is around the fact that there are only four out of 10 people with disabilities are employed. And we're in a region where there's like a 2% unemployment rate. And so I'm wondering if the panel has some good strategies in thinking through how do you get more people of differing abilities employed and also injured veterans? We started a pilot called the Bill IT that has to do with training them for basic cyber and IT jobs. But it's now the challenge of creating a big enough pipeline that the employers in this region are going to be interested in partnering with us in order to be able to do that. But when you see that Melwood is only one of about 450 nonprofits that employ about 35,000 people of different abilities around the country, we are an overlooked pipeline to provide some of these 
high demand jobs and to fulfill it. So I just wondered if the panel had some suggestions. Have you done some work around this or um, in fact targeting the uh, Well, first of all, community? I want to salute Melwood. I actually pushed people into that abilities program. It's a great program. The pilot is very successful. Uh, and I um, actually I just connected them to a, a IT employer. So I think there's more just, I think in this region, you know, we talk about, and Matt was talking about, you know, we need a leader. I think it's, in my opinion, it's not about leading, it's about communicating. There are a lot of things going on. If we communicated about it better, if we had shared data and shared goals so that individually we can all be leaders, I think we'd be in a better place. I will say that I do believe that the people with disabilities, their pipeline is an incredibly talented pipeline. I think especially for information technology and information security and some of the other communication jobs. One of the things that I do from a strategy perspective uh, to reach that pipeline is I put information about uh, our employment programs in Arlington in mailings that go to people that earn or that receive social SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. So at least I'm hitting them where they are. And I think that's one of the things that we do more of. We're all here in this room, but we're not hitting people where they are. One of the things that we learned from the Bridges Out of Poverty Movement is we need to go to where they are. And if we can do more of that, uh, we can move more of these individuals into a pathway towards prosperity. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Please. Thank you, and thank you for sharing your time with us and as well as um, the work that you're doing. My name is Sharita. I work with Apple One. Uh, we are part of the Act One Group, which is a global workforce development solution. We do staffing, recruiting, and career resource training. The question that I have, though, goes back to the very first conversation with Nisha and Brent, where they talked about a particular thread in this issue uh, that I wanted you to speak to, and that was family formation and specifically around the fractures in single family households. Uh, one of the areas that I look into is mass incarceration and that being a really big barrier for families and for folks who are coming out to re-enter the workforce. So my question really has two parts. One, what data, if any, is out there about the number of families in your communities that are suffering from a loved one that is incarcerated? And B, what programs are out there for workforce development for those who are re-entering from being incarcerated? Is anybody here familiar with that or in practice? Dave, you say some? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's data out there. Um, as far as uh, programs, our American Job Centers across the greater Washington region all do support uh, individuals that are, uh, are returning uh, citizens, as well as organizations like OAR. There's one for Alexander Arlington and Fairfax, and I mean, Falls Church, and there's one for Fairfax, and I think the rest of Northern Virginia. I think they're called OAR Northern Virginia. Uh, so there's a couple programs. One of the programs that came online uh, recently that I love out of Alexander City is called Zero Model. It's actually a uh, for-profit, it's an incubator uh, for and run by ex-offenders. They have uh, a few different uh, uh, programs in residence right now, one of them being a, and I'm probably gonna butcher this, a temp agency for construction workers. And so many uh, construction workers that have a background, uh, a, 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 uh, they have a hard time getting employed by the, the primary uh, contractors. Who here needs, has a hard time finding somebody to do some construction work, either in your business or in your home? Just one person? <laughs> <laughs> there's this talent base that we're not attacking because there's this barrier. But here's this organization that's put together a program where we now can get to them. And guess what? They're very successful. Uh, everybody they have on their bench is out there working. No one cares what their background is because they just need the, the work done. And so I think we need more uh, um, innovative programs like that uh, in our region. Carla, did you? Yeah, and the, the zero model in Northern Virginia was exactly the, the example I was gonna give. But just use that as, the, as a point to address sort of social enterprise um, as a mechanism and sort of look at which, which ones of those are present in this area. And it's my assessment that we have a li limited number, particularly in the Northern Virginia area, and just really 
look to expand those options that sort of um, name what you would qualify as difficult to employ populations and build industries and build opportunities to help those them to bridge that gap. But that's one particular model that I know is very effective. Yeah, and, re and real quick, two good models in West Philadelphia. There's the Enterprise Center um, that we uh, worked with at EDA um, that, to David's point, is in the community. So it helps to resolve some of the transportation issues, but it serves that disadvantaged population. And then in Camden, New Jersey, there's, I can't remember the name of the organization, but again, was focused on that issue and doing some great things, both construction and also in the uh, automobile uh, field. So two models to look at maybe for some best practices. Terrific. Um, I'm afraid we have come upon our time. Uh, and so please join me in thanking our panelists. And also, please join me in welcoming Bob Lazaro. He's the executive director of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, and here he is to continue our program. Hello again. I'm Bob Lazaro. I'm the executive director of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. And as we've learned today, economic mobility takes more than income. It takes power, the kind that skills-based training and education through the tech talent pipeline can provide. And as Nisha so eloquently explained, it takes a sense of belonging and being valued in the community. Last year at this same event, we learned from the Community Foundation's Opportunity Index that one half of all children in Northern Virginia live in immigrant families, 50%. And according to the Fairfax County Public Schools data, more than 180 different languages or dialects are spoken at home in their elementary school populations. New or about to become new Americans abound in our region. And if we're serious about local economic mobility, then how do we, as a, uh, how do, we do a better job as a region in promoting that essential sense of value and belonging? We know what the problems are. What are we going to do about it? To help answer that question, the Regional Commission, in partnership with the Community Foundation, is delighted to announce a new One Region initiative that will launch this year. Its purpose is to create a more inclusive region in which all people, including recent immigrants and refugees, are welcomed and invited to engage with our larger community to fully contribute their talents. The Regional Commission will gather and publish data on the economic impact of the immigrant population in Northern Virginia, which is significant and better quantify it for greater understanding. The Community Foundation will hold a series of listening sessions across the region to better understand the barriers our local immigrants face to full participation. Together, we will create a welcoming plan for the region, presented at the Shape of the Region Conference next year, and provide concrete strategies for our local jurisdictions and our private sector companies can contribute to a more inclusive, welcoming community where economic mobility grows and thrives. As a former local government elected official, I can tell you it's always good to learn from folks who are really doing good stuff in their communities, especially what's happening in Fairfax County. Thank you all for coming and for engaging in this important topic, and we'll see you all next year. Thank you. Thank you.